Hey guys, today I'll be continuing my series on the classics and we'll be covering Louis Paulson. So Paulson was a German player and he was a very, very strong player, basically top five in the second half of the 19th century, so the 1860s, 70s, and 80s. Uh, and I would categorize Paulson as a very strong positional player and very, very good defender. Uh, he had a lot of wins against some of the best attackers of that time, Morphy, Anderson, Blackburn, and others. Uh, basically by defending against their attacks and later using his positional advantages to, to win games. In fact, I think Paulson is pretty underrated when it comes to his uh, contribution to uh, chess theory. A lot of openings and opening variations are named after him, um, but a lot of his ideas and his style of play was later expanded upon by players like Steinitz and Nimzovich. So Paulson never wrote any books. I think that's why his name isn't super well known among the chess public, such as Steinitz and Nimzovich, who put a lot of their ideas into writing. Um, but it seems like he came up with a lot of concepts in his game uh, that were uh, later expanded upon and used by uh, people like Steinitz and, and so on. Uh, Paulson also had a ton of contributions to opening theory. Uh, he came up with some systems for why, like in the Scotch game and the Vienna, um, but his main contribution was to the Sicilian defense. Defense. In fact, it seems like he basically not necessarily invented, but he experimented with a lot of Sicilian formations that are now commonplace today. And so he can kind of be considered almost like a father of the Sicilian defense uh, based just on his many contributions. He had a lot of games featuring Sicilian structures, for instance, after uh, Knight to F3. Uh, the Paulson Sicilian is mainly associated with the moves E6, takes, takes, and A6 or with uh, knight c6 followed by a6 here. Um, but Paulson not only played this structure, but he would play a6 followed by d6. Uh, this is nowadays more commonly known as the Scheveningen formation uh, based on a tournament played in the Netherlands in the 1920s, several decades after Paulson's time. So he was clearly very much ahead of his time. He's also credited with inventing the Sicilian dragon, nowadays of course is one of the most popular Sicilians out there. Um, he didn't have a ton of games but he would uh, quite frequently play the classical Sicilian through the move order d4 takes takes knight f6 knight c3 knight c6 and in quite a few games he would later follow up with g6 and kind of playing more of a Sic Sicilian dragon. Um, he would also play a lot of games with the so-called Boleslavsky variation, a uh, variation named after a Soviet player who again came many many years after Paulson where Black puts the pawn on e5 and plays with this e5 d6 uh, pawn chain. So I want to show you some of his, um, perhaps not his most famous wins, but wins that were very characteristic uh, of Paulson's style and actually are pretty instructive for Sicilian players today. Uh, so in this first game here he was playing uh, black and as we can see the structure and formation uh, it feels very modern you would see a lot of games today uh, featuring this kind of setup from black's point of view this game was played back in 1889 so here Paulson plays uh, b5 uh, nowadays again we would consider this a very thematic Sicilian idea but back then there was basically no such thing these players were uh, kind of uh, inventing stuff on their own and in many ideas uh, Paulson would play the idea knight to a5 knight to c4 and trying to use this semi-open c file uh, that that black uh, is basically trying to get in, in the open Sicilian. Um, so here white decided to take on c6, black played bishop takes c6, and white advances with this move e5. And this is very characteristic of the Romantic era, just playing aggressively and trying to attack. Um, but the way Paulson played the game was he was really just looking for the counterattack, and it was clear that he felt like if the opponent did not have any kind of strategic advantage, then there's no reason they should be able to get any kind of real initiative. This is something that Steinitz would later uh, really expand upon, uh, the idea that an attack just can't come out of nowhere. An attack has to come based on some form of strategic uh, advantage. Otherwise, the defense should have equal or better chances to fend off the attack. And here, this e5 move, yeah, positionally speaking, there's no reason why this should be working. Uh, black takes on e5 here. I should note that if he started with bishop takes f3, this would run into the intermezzo e takes f6, and this would not be good for black. Bishop takes d1, white takes the bishop on e7, is threatening to take the rook with tempo, so black has to kind of take this one back. And then after rook takes d1, white would have uh, two pieces for the rook. Uh, 
Instead, black simply takes on e5 first, white takes on c6. If I were to recapture on e5, then black could simply play queen takes e5, and black would be a pawn up. So white takes on c6, queen takes c6, and goes f takes e5. Um, but here after knight to e4, black trades off the knights, knight takes e4, queen takes e4, and all white has done is create some exchanges, but has also left himself with a very weak position. This pawn on e5 uh, is super weak, the pawn on c2 is also hanging, and white basically has zero compensation to, sh uh, to show for it. So he played queen d3, black could already trade queens and go into a very nice endgame, but Paulson just takes on e5, uh, and then he mops up pretty easily, just trades off all the pieces, and uh, wins a fine technical game. Uh, in our next example, Paulson is again playing black, and again we see a slightly different formation. This one today would often come from a uh, Taimon of Sicilian, where black starts with knight c6 and queen c7 in the opening. Uh, and here Paulson goes for a pretty familiar idea, uh, knight to e5. Uh, not necessarily wanting to take the bishop, but rather heading again for the c4 square. So white plays bishop f4, black goes d6, and this is another moment that I felt uh, was, was quite impressive. He was clearly not worried about white taking on e5 and doubling his pawns, because he probably understood that the central double pawns are not weak, they're actually quite good, controlling so many key squares in the center of the board. Um, as well as opening up the way for the dark squared bishop to now become an active piece, since white has given up uh, their own dark squared bishop. And not to mention, uh, black will one day be able to get uh, a lot of use out of the open d file for his, uh, his king side rook. Uh, I inc I've actually included another game uh, in the study where Paulson allows this trade and uh, just crushes his opponent, you know, blows him off the board with, with the positional uh, superiority. So in this game, white uh, doesn't take on e5, plays queen to e2, black goes bishop e7, rook ad1, castles, rook f e1, knight c4, hitting the pawn on b2, and uh, also creating a somewhat hidden threat. White goes bishop c1, and then black executes his second threat with knight takes a3, uh, taking advantage of the fact that the pawn on b2 is kind of overloaded. If b takes a3, queen takes c3, black has won a pawn for basically no compensation. Uh, instead, after knight takes a3, white pushed e5, uh, which again does not quite work out, just leads to exchanges. Black takes on e5, queen takes e5, and goes bishop to d6. Now we get a little bit of fireworks here. White plays queen takes d6, queen takes d6, and bishop takes h7. So winning back the queen, uh, but having to give back the bishop in return. Uh, king takes h7, rook takes d6, knight takes c2, and black ended up with uh, an extra pawn in the endgame. In addition to some strategic advantages, the bishop on b7 being really good, and black's rooks being really, really close uh, to the action. And this is kind of what makes the Sicilian such an interesting and good opening uh, for players like Paulson who are counter-attackers, that you get these long-term positional advantages. So if white isn't able to make anything out of their lead and development, their initiative out of the opening, in the long run, black just gets very, very good chances to get some kind of uh, solid advantage in the end game. In the next example here, you see Paulson playing uh, the formation known now as the Boslavsky structure with black's pawns on e5 and d6. And the main drawback to the structure for black is, of course, the fact that black has given up the d5 square for good. And if white is able to make use of this square, a lot of times white actually gets uh, a very annoying and long-term positional advantage. So black's idea in the structure is typically to get compensation for this square in the form of counterplay, whether it's on the c-file or in some cases on the dark squares. In this case, I actually think the opening worked out quite well for white. I think white has a better position. This f3, e4 pawn chain is actually doing a good job of restricting the bishop onto b7, and at any moment, white can try to use the d5 square uh, for a positional advantage. Um, but here, Paulson does something very interesting, and I just really like the way he outplays his opponent. Uh, he starts with the move knight to b8, um, which back then I think was a very, very rare occurrence. 
Uh, in today's top level chess, backwards knight moves are not that common, but they're common enough that uh, you see them uh, in some openings quite frequently. For instance, in the Rui Lopez, uh, the Briar variation is basically based on this retreat of bringing the knight back to b8 and now to d7, where the knight actually has better prospects. Uh, in this case, from d7, the knight is going to then head to b6 and, again, this c4 square. And you can kind of just see uh, Paulson's deep understanding of this position, the fact that he, he was willing to spend so many tempi uh, to improve his knight. Of course, here he uh, could play knight to a5, but this knight would just immediately uh, get traded off. So after knight to b8, uh, white makes a very aggressive move g4, which I think was a big mistake because this kingside advance is just not going to land in time. Instead, it was better for white to try to take advantage of uh, black's maneuver with a move like a4, uh, forcing black to play b4, and now after knight to d5, this pawn on b4 would be a pretty serious target. After takes, takes a5, white could play a move like c3, and I think white would have a pretty serious edge here. Um, nothing catastrophic just yet, but black would, would clearly uh, be worse. Instead, white plays the move g4, which just ends up making long-term weaknesses. Knight bd7, queen e1, preparing to bring the queen out to g3. Uh, black plays rook c8. A3, stopping any kind of uh, B4 pushes, which black was already threatening to do, uh, and now knight to B6. So the knight is not only threatening to jump to C4, but is also supporting a potential D5 break, which would really make things very, very dangerous for white's king on the long diagonal. Uh, knight A5 was played, bishop A8, queen to F2, knight FD7, another very typical move for this kind of Sicilian, bringing the other knight over to the queen side, not just to defend the knight on b6, but in some cases to transfer the knight to c5. Uh, white plays rook to d2, knight c5, b4, bishop h4, throwing this in just to take control over some dark squares and also uh, so that the knight on b6 doesn't uh, is not attacked once the queen moves, queen g2, knight e6. And now it's clear that black is just playing on the dark squares. This knight is eyeing the f4 and the d4 squares. At some moment, black might want to play bishop g5 and trade off the bishops and just leave white with a ton of dark square weaknesses. Uh, here white played the move knight to d1, uh, somewhat anticipating the, the trade of bishops. And Paulson takes his chance to break in the center with d5. So very, very strong move and really punishing white for making this g4 advance a basically inappropriate moment where now black is just exploding the center and is totally caught up and getting a ton of counterplay. And this is really what the Sicilian is all about. So I think if you want to learn how to play the Sicilian, uh, it would be actually a pretty interesting place to start with is uh, Paulson's games. Uh, the final game I want to show you guys is a game uh, Paulson played with white uh, to demonstrate that he was actually a pretty elegant attacker uh, when it was called for as well. Uh, here in this position he was playing white and his, op la his opponent's last move was this move h5, just trying to open the h-file and get kingside counterplay. So of course he goes g5, he tries to keep things closed, knight h7, queen to e3, and now black plays f6. And now it's a little bit too late for white to keep everything closed. If he goes h4, black will simply start taking on g5. If he takes on f6, black can go g takes f6 with an open g file and planning to put the rook on g8 next, where white will have to defend uh, the bishop on g2. The pawn on h3 also becomes kind of a target. Instead of going for this, uh, Paulson probably understood the importance of tempo in the attack, and he just starts to get things going on the queen side with the move a5 just trying to play a takes b6, open the a file, and get his own attack against black's king. So of course this involves just giving up the g5 pawn, so it's not like he wasn't ever willing to sacrifice. Black goes knight takes g5, and now the h3 pawn is being threatened, so he goes very quiet move king to h2, which I was really impressed by because he just defends the pawn, He's just given up a whole pawn in the process, but his attack is moving uh, one tempo faster, and he does have pretty serious threats. So now black took on a5, rook takes a5, b6, rook to a7, white's pieces are getting a lot closer to black's king, bishop c6, and the start of a very elegant combination with c5. The point being after b takes c5, white's idea was to play 
queen takes c5. A very surprising move at first. It doesn't feel like white should be able to sacrifice the queen here, but it turns out after d takes c5, rook takes c7 check, black's king is forced to step into a discovered attack, and white can go rook takes g7 check, followed by rook takes g6, winning the queen back, eventually with an extra pawn in the end game and totally winning position. So after queen takes c5, black had to drop back with queen to e8, but now it's clear that white's attack is breaking through and black is just way too slow here. Queen a5, 96 was played, rook to c1, g5, queen c6 check, king d7, and rook takes c6. Actually a very strong and accurate move. After the kind of more obvious queen takes c6 check, king to e7, White is winning, but is not exactly breaking through right away. Of course, white is just up a piece and, and could drop the bishop back. Uh, but the game's rook takes c6 is actually a lot stronger, threatening to win immediately with rook takes d6 check. And in case of king to e7, white can sack on c7 and break through uh, on the dark squares with bishop takes d6, followed by a quick mate. If the king goes to g8, the queen is dropping to c4. Uh, so after rook takes e6, this was basically the end of the game. Black played g takes f4, rook takes d6, and here black resigned as white's next move is going to be rook takes e6 check and winning the queen, if not uh, mating outright. So a really strong uh, attacking game, and uh, Paulson, I would say, is one of the players I really didn't know a lot about before making the this series, but I'm glad to have taken the time to, to look through uh, a lot of his games. Uh, not only was he just a fantastic positional player, he also had some very nice... Uh, attacking victories, and in fact he was even a very strong and perhaps one of the best blindfold players in the world. Uh, he, along with Paul Morphy, uh, were famous for conducting these blindfold simuls where they would play 10, sometimes more, uh, blindfold games against multiple players. Uh, I've included one blindfold game that he played that was part of the simuls that I found was a really, really nice attacking game, and if you want to check it out as well as the rest of the games in this series, uh, do make sure to check out the link to the Lee Chess study that's below in the YouTube description. All right, hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you did, please do leave it a thumbs up, and I'll catch you next time. Take care.